Hi. Oh, good, even waves, this is good. Um, I just wanted to say to start with that this is an astounding event to have organized. And all the women who've gone into the months of organizing really deserve Nobel Prizes in feminist organizing. Uh, when I was asked uh, to speak in this particular forum, um, I had been thinking a lot about women in domestic work, in um, paid domestic work, and I thought perhaps this might be a moment to share some of um, my thoughts on that, but also mainly what I've been taught by women who've organized um, as domestic workers. We're in a very particular moment in history, and of course this Nordic Women's Forum itself is happening in history. Um, and one of the distinguishing characteristics of the moment that the Nordic Women's Forum is meeting is it's at a time in world history where the numbers of women working in domestic work um, are burgeoning. So if you watch the history of the world, one of the things that would characterize the early 2000s would be that so many more women from so many more countries are now trying to make a living cleaning other people's bathtubs. And that's a very political moment because there are two things that are happening. First of all, more and more women are themselves trying to both have households and to have paid jobs outside their own households. And if they have households with elderly people in the household who need extra care, or they just simply need cleaning, of course, if they have children that need to be cared for, the way those women, many of us, have gone about gaining employment outside our homes is to hire some other woman to come into our homes to do the domestic work that we're not able to do. So the more that women seek paid work outside the home, the more likely it is, not automatic, but the more likely it is that those very same women, oftentimes feminists, um, employ another woman, sometimes from their own country, sometimes from a poor class in their country, sometimes a rural woman migrating to the city from their own country, and increasingly, women from other countries to clean, to take care of elderly parents, and to take care of children. So to talk about women's aspirations to have their own paid work, one has to talk about, well, who's doing the work at home? And that oftentimes is a woman from the Philippines, from Ethiopia, from Sri Lanka, from India, from Brazil, from Mexico, from Guatemala. That is, very particular countries are now increasingly dependent for their own balance of payments. Now we're getting into high finance. High finance depends on somebody else cleaning a tub, a shower, a sink, many time zones away. And in fact, if you look at the economies of the Philippines now, which really stands out, in fact, the Philippines would not be able to balance its payments if it didn't have money being sent home by Filipinas, women from the Philippines, working abroad as domestic workers. Now, the politics of domestic work is the politics of privatization. We talk about privatization a lot in all our countries. We worry about it a lot um, because oftentimes with privatization comes irresponsibility and unaccountability. But domestic workers are the ones who are experiencing extreme privatization. Because in many countries, it's presumed if you work in somebody else's, quote, private home, 
You, in fact, are not a worker. You are a companion. You are a helper. You're not actually, quote, a worker. And this has been an enormous burden politically on women doing domestic work around the world. Added to that, so many of the women who do domestic work around the world, in fact, do not have legal standing in the country where they're doing that work. They are what is oftentimes called an undocumented worker. If they have legal status, it is not uncommon. Let me just ask you. I can't see everybody in the dark back there, but I can, unfortunately, I can see all of you. Right. How many of you have ever done, even if it's low, paid domestic work? How many people have done? Look around, everybody. Look around, look around. Right? There are, there are at least 15 stories right there, and probably more in the dark up there, right? One of the things that happens when you are a woman from another country doing domestic work, paid domestic work, abroad, is that your employer has the legal right to take your passport. Now, just think about how frightening that is. Just think how terrifying it is if you've managed to get some kind of legal standing to come into a country, and then your paid employer, with whom you have virtually no negotiating rights, takes your passport and has the legal right to take your passport. Oftentimes, women who are abused um, in that domestic household that they are working in have no choice but to try to escape, especially if they are full-time live-in workers, no choice but to seek escape and to go to their local consulate. So the privatization of the domestic space in which women as domestic workers works um, is a privatization that is not just unfair, it is dangerous. Now, in the last several years, something quite phenomenal has happened. And that is that women working as domestic workers in these isolating, domestic, privatized spaces have begun to organize. They've begun to organize nationally, and they've begun to organize internationally. This is largely because of their skills with the internet, but it's also because of their determination to no longer be exploited in the work that they do. The leaders have been women from Brazil and the Philippines, and they, together with women from a variety of countries, decided, you, know, you just have to think about the strategizing. You're, scr you're scrubbing a tub, and what you're thinking of is, should I go to Geneva? Because that's where they decided, the women who were the activists in this global movement, decided that they needed to start with the International Labor Organization. And so two years ago, they managed to pressure the government representatives that met at the ILO to change labor law and labor standards internationally. And they passed a monumental ILO convention, which is called 189, 189. And if you don't know it, write it down on the back of your hand, 189. And what it says, and this may sound quite, it's a radical statement, let's put it this way. And the radical statement is this, domestic work is work. Because one of the things that they found that created these chasms, these loopholes miles wide in national law, was that domestic workers were exempted time and again every time labor rights were written into national law. That domestic workers were exempted. That is, the employers 
of domestic workers were exempted from having to be the upholders of rights of women who worked as domestic workers in their, quote, private spaces. So the most radical statement of ILO Convention 189 is that domestic workers are workers, which means that they have rights that other workers are accorded by national and international law. Now, some of you kind of keep track of treaties. You know how hard it is to get a treaty institutionalized and then implemented. Keep this in mind. You have to have governments pass ILO Convention 189 for it to become part of international law that can be enforced, and second of all, to weave it into local national law. So now, those same domestic workers who ama amaz amazingly got the ILO to pass Convention 189 are literally taking it on the road or around the globe. The very first legislature to pass ILO, that is to ratify, not only sign it, but to ratify it, was Brazil. This is not necessarily um, what you would expect. The Brazilian government is also very dependent on remittances sent home by women as working as domestic workers. That is, you could say, as a Brazilian official who watches the balance of payments, we can't afford to have our Brazilian women abroad have too many rights because they won't be able to get as much gainful employment to send money home to help balance the budget in Brazil. But in fact, the women working as domestic workers in Brazil had organized in Brazil to the point that they were able to push the government to sign 189. At this point, one of the things for all of us to ask, I know the answer, unfortunately, in my own country, the, one of the things to ask is, is, has your own government signed and ratified Convention 189? And if not, why not? And what are the arguments made for either delaying the signing or for not ratifying? Because behind every one of those hesitations, every one of those resistances, is a denial of what real work looks like and women's rights to not only do real work, but be treated as workers and to have the rights of workers. Thank you very much.